Hi, Shauna. Hi, how are you? All right. Welcome, everybody, to our apiary. Uh, we are coming to you from the Niagara region in Ontario. It is a sort of, I don't know what this weather is called, <laughs> questionable day. <laughs> um, so my name is Shauna McQuarrie. I am a project assistant at Eggscape. I am also uh, an Ontario certified teacher. I am also one of Eggscape's teacher ambassadors. Um, and my other hat that I wear um, is this one right here. It's my, my beekeeping hat. So my husband, Ken, and I are going to uh, take you guys around today and show you a little bit about what we do and how we do it. And part of that is talking about the gear that we have to use as beekeepers. My zipper's stuck. <laughs> <laughs> Let oh, me help. There you go. <laughs> so the first piece of gear is our bee suit or our veil. Uh, mine is a jacket. I am wearing shorts today. Our bees are um, generally pretty chill. Um, they are in sort of, they're in good humor today. Uh, so we're going to, I don't really feel the need. I feel comfortable enough to use bare hands and bare legs today. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about some of this other gear that we have here. You want to take it away, Beekeeper Ken? Sure. So the thing that we most love that bees give to us is honey. This is a one kilogram jar of honey. And in a bee's entire lifetime, a worker bee can bring about one gram of honey back into the hive. That's as much as one single bee produces. So a one kilogram jar of honey takes a thousand bees their entire life to produce honey. Now a worker bee lives for about 30 to 45 days. And in her whole life, she's making one gram of honey. So when you eat honey, you're eating a very special treat, something that the bees have worked very, very hard to make for you. Now we do have some tools that we use when we're working with the bees and they help to perform some very important functions. The first tool is the bee smoker. Now what we do with the smoker is we will take some flammable material like some dead grass or some newspaper. We put it in and we light it on fire and then we can add some wood chips that will help to burn for a long time. Now the benefit of using a smoker is that when you put some smoke on the bees, it will cause them to relax. It stops any distress pheromone that they make, any signal that they're sharing with each other that they're upset. And it also makes them want to eat honey. And when a bee has a belly full of hung honey, it gets kind of tired and relaxed and calm and it doesn't want to fight. Just like we do after we eat lunch, right? <laughs> now our bees are pretty happy today. It's, it's really warm weather. It's kind of sunny. They're bringing in lots of nectar, so they're pretty happy. We're not even going to use our smoker today, but on days when you need it, it's a very helpful tool. Yeah. So this other tool that we use, this is kind of the, I would say, one of the most important tools that we use. Um, this is called a hive tool, um, and you'll notice it's got lots of goop on it. Um, bees make honey, but they also make some other substances depending on what the what the job is, what they're trying to accomplish in the hive, what they're working on. Um, and one of the really super, super sticky substances that they make is called propolis. Um, and it's really, really gooey and it makes everything stick. And they use it to seal cracks in their hive and um, they use it for all sorts of things. But what, it, what we think it is, is a combination of um, like wax and tree sap and bee spit, <laughs> all the things that they use to make sort of this, this kind of sticky cement. And in order for us to actually get into the beehive, uh, this tool is really handy. And it also helps the, the frames in the beehive, which you're going to see in a few minutes. It also helps us pry them apart. And one more tool that we'll show you today, we won't be using it today, but it is important. If you have a frame of honey, and you want to take the bees off of it, you can gently brush them off with this bee brush. It's, it has really soft bristles. It's really useful for working with. All right, so let's get into the beehive. Yep. Push on the button. Right. So if you look right here, you'll see the main entrance of the beehive. That's where the bees come in and out as they're flying. And today, you'll notice there are a lot of bees just sitting on the entrance to the hive. And what they're doing is they're flapping their wings, they're drawing air in, 
And inside the hive, other bees are moving that air through. They're trying to dry down and evaporate the nectar to turn it into honey. They're also trying to keep their brood nest. That's the area where the baby bees are. They're trying to keep it at a good temperature for those bees to be comfortable and grow. And we're going to be showing you some brood. We're going to be showing you some honey. So you'll see that. But today, because it's so hot, a lot of bees are working down on the entrance. Now, this is one bee colony. It's four boxes. I'll talk about these in a second. But these are four boxes. Down in the bottom, the queen will be laying eggs, and they'll be raising the baby bees. And then up above, they'll be storing honey. Now, we've done something as beekeepers. In the spring, you can make what are called splits. This is how we make new bee colonies. And so on the top here, we have two nucleus colonies. Nucleus just means small, core. And so these two boxes here are some smaller beehives that we've been starting, and we're going to have a peek at them. So in the front, you can see the small entrance that this nucleus colony has, and the little bee just came out. That's right. All right, so we'll open this up. And remember, Shauna shared that there's propolis in the hive. They like to use propolis to stick things down. So the lid was a little bit stuck. And we'll tip it up. And you can see that there's some bees on the lid. Hey, Ken, we have a question from a viewer. You do? Yes. Sienna would like to know how many bees are in one hive. That's an excellent question, Sienna. So this is a nucleus colony. And it will probably have somewhere around 4,000 bees in it. Now that sounds like a lot, but it's actually a very small colony. This year, larger colony over here, I mean, we can already see about almost 100 bees right on the front. Inside the beehive, there can be up to 60 or 80,000 bees. Remember we said one honeybee can just make one gram of honey in its whole lifetime? Well, one bee colony can produce 100 pounds of honey in one season. And it takes a lot of bees to make that much honey. So, so a bee colony can have around 60 or 80,000 bees, although this little nucleus colony is much smaller. So when I'm taking a frame out, I just move nice and slow, and I loosen off the propolis with the hive I'm tool. Sure why we don't have gloves on. Oh, good question. <laughs> um, it's a question we get asked a lot. Um, and, and really it's because it sort of allows the bees to teach us what they like and don't like. Mm -hmm. If we move really fast, we're going to get stung, right? The bees are stingy creatures. Um, and they don't want to sting, and we don't want to get stung. But by using our bare hands and being really calm and moving slowly, you'll notice when Ken's touching things and when I'm touching things, we don't go super fast. And bees aren't aggressive. Some people are afraid of bees, but if you move slow and calm, the bees aren't worried. They're busy doing their work. Even if I touch a bee, it doesn't sting me because I'm being gentle and I'm being careful. Now, if I move real fast, I might get stung, and I might get stung today. I partly hope that I do so that you can see what that's like, but I'm not gonna try to get stung. So here's our first frame. And if we look carefully, we can see that there's lots of shiny stuff right here. That is nectar that the bees are turning into honey. And it's really glistening. So I hope you can see that on the camera. Yeah, I can move it up. Oh, sure. Just go a little. There we go. Great. And if you look right up at the top here, you can see that there's capped honey. So there's some wax over top. Yeah, I'll use that. Once the bees dry the honey down, to a low enough moisture content, once the they honey? get most of the water out, the honey coming out right there. they cover it up with some wax, and you can see that honey right there. We have another question from the audience. Yep. Sure. Alicia would like to know, um, her grade two class would like to know, what do bees eat? Well, we just showed you the first thing that bees like to eat. The second one's on there, too. Oh, is it? Where? <laughs> Near you. Oh, yeah, look at that. Um, we'll probably have a better frame of that. Yep. Um, so there's two main things that bees like to eat. So 
Oh, Hi, Shauna. We're having a little bit of trouble hearing you. Oh, okay. If I go a little closer to the microphone here, how about that? Is it better now? It's a little bit better. Here, why don't you do it? Okay. <laughs> I'll come up front. All right. If you look right here, we showed you the honey, which is really glistening. And if you look right in here, I'm going to just uh, clear some bees away. They don't like when you blow on them. They move. If you look right in there, that's called bee bread. And I'm going to just pull a little bit out. There we go. So this bee bread is a combination of pollen that the bees bring in from flowers and honey. And they, they pack that together in there and it kind of ferments. And that's a way to store it. Now, if uh, you're familiar with the food that we eat as people, we eat carbohydrates and we eat protein, among other things. So protein would be things like meat or beans and Carbohydrates would be things like bread or pasta. Sugars. Sugars. Yeah. The bees eat protein and carbohydrate as well. The honey is carbohydrate, a sugar, and the pollen is a protein. And I hope we get to show you a bee with some pollen There's on its one, legs. I one see right one. There, but it's hard to grab. Yeah, we'll, we'll try that in a minute. Okay, let's have a look at this frame and see what we have. I believe it is. Okay, again, I'm just seeing a lot of pollen in here, but I'm not seeing much else. Oh, I do see the queen, though. Where do you want to bring her up to the Oh, camera? yeah. Here, I'll hold and you point. All right. <laughs> All right, we're coming back up. So the queen bee in a hive is a little bit bigger oh, than all the others. She's shy. She ran to the other right side. Over here. Oh, she's oh. running through again. <laughs> okay, here she is. So she is much longer than the other bees. Oh, she's and... so smart. She's playing a game with us. Guys. Yeah. There she is <laughs> right the there. So that queen, her job is to lay the eggs. So she's walking around and she's looking in all the little honey, well, all the comb, and she's looking for an empty spot where she can lay an egg. And when she finds a good spot to lay an egg, she'll put her abdomen, her back end, into that opening and she'll lay one egg in there. <laughs> she's pretty quick there she comes. and the worker bees you'll see that they're all around her they're helping to feed her and clean her and take care of her so that she can lay lots of eggs just tip it so she doesn't fall yeah, I don't we have that. one more audience question from yeah. Maiko he would like to know how you can tell the queen bee apart from the other bees and also whether you can tell a queen bee is the queen when they're babies oh yes and so the queen bee, we, we can tell her apart from the other bees because she's larger than them. And sometimes she has a lighter color. So the one we were just looking at, she's right here. She has a bit of a lighter color, but it can be really hard to find the queen, especially if you're in a full-sized bee colony. In this little nucleus colony, it's not so hard to find her. But uh, when you're looking through 60 or 80,000 bees, it's kind of like where's Waldo? And she can be very hard to find. And some beekeepers will actually mark the queen. They'll put a little dot, just like a, like a little, little bit of, it's almost like a marker. Um, just a little dot on their back just to see. Do you want to pull this guy off? Sure. Uh, but just before we do that. Okay. Now, the other question was, can you tell she's a queen when she's a baby? <laughs> well, here's an interesting thing. The queen you just saw is a brand new queen. She's only maybe about a week or two old. And she looks different from the rest of the bees right from the beginning of her life. And, uh, okay, well, we've got some eggs on this one. So we're going to share it. Yep. If we can. So this is going to be very difficult to see. But inside each of these cells, there's an egg. So that new queen has been laying eggs, and they're very, very, very tiny. So tiny, you probably can't see them. If you thought of a grain of rice and shrunk it down to about one-tenth the size, that's the size of the eggs that we're seeing in here. One reason I know she's a brand new queen is because we only have eggs and very, very young larvae. So we're going to try to find some other larva for you. But before we do that, do you see this bee right here? See those little yellow sacs on her legs? Those are called 
the pollen sacs. Do you remember the... Corbicula. They're called corbicula. <laughs> and when a bee lands on a flower and gets pollen all over its body, she'll use her front legs to work the pollen back into these corbicula uh, pollen baskets. And she uses them to bring it back to the hive. And then the bees can pack that away in the cells. Let's just set this here. Sure. So I think there's a clean cup on one side. Oh, great. Yeah. I don't know what that means, but <laughs> must be your side. I don't see one here. No, oh, All right, and again, we can see lots of nectar on this frame, and a lot of capped honey here. So I think we're gonna open up a different one and find some uh, some brood. capped brood. Um. Is there a question you'd like to answer while we're doing that? Um, I can't let me have me. <laughs> well, he's getting the other one. Let me see what else is there. Oh, we didn't do a... Probably not. Probably not. Let's talk about the, the shape of the, the honeycomb. Oh, yes. So... We're going to talk about the shape of a honeycomb. And a honeycomb isn't triangle and it's not square. And those would be structures that you'd think would be really, really strong, right? You think of like we build a house, it's really strong. It's usually got, you know, four sides, sturdy. A triangle is like a roof, nice and strong. But there's a stronger shape in nature. And the strongest shape we find in nature is the hexagon. Now, this is a good frame for you to see because you can see we have a plastic foundation. Now, we insert these into the frames, and it has the hexagon shape. And when the bees are making their comb, they make it the same hexagon shape. And hexagons are very strong. A frame can hold a lot of honey and can get very heavy without the wax breaking because of its shape. But wax is very fragile. It's very easy to break. If I just rub my hive tool against the comb, the little bits of wax break very easily. Now, the bees can fix that easy, too. So I'm not worried about it. But uh, because they use hexagons, they can make wax, which is something that's very, very weak, very, very strong because of its shape. Okay, so we should focus on the life cycle and the drones. That's right. All right. Okay, this is a good life cycle conversation. <laughs> yeah, so we've got young larvae right here. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to hold it or do you want to? Sure, I can hold it up for you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, in that previous frame we showed you, you, I was telling you about the eggs, which were very, very hard to see. Now, in this frame, we have some young larvae down in here. You might see what looks like a little white worm, and it's kind of curled up in a little shape, like a smiley. Now, that's a baby bee. That's a larva, and the worker bees are feeding those larvae. They're putting food into that cell, and after a certain number of days, they're going to fill that up with food, and they're going to cover it up with wax, just like this. And if you're familiar with caterpillars, what do they do? They make a cocoon, and they go through what's called a pupil stage inside that cocoon. And when they emerge, they're something different than before. They're a butterfly. Well, these larvae, the little white worm-shaped things, inside these cells, they're building cocoons. And they go through a pupil stage, just like a caterpillar. And when they come out, they're not a butterfly. They're a honeybee. Now, right here, we can see two different kinds of bees. These are worker bees. They're both female. This is a drone bee. It's a male. Now, one of the interesting things about drone bees is they don't have stingers. So we can pick them up and they don't sting us. <laughs> We've got another so, question from the audience. Yes. How, what's the lifespan of a honeybee? Excellent question. So the worker bees, they're working very hard all summer long. And so their life cycle is relatively short compared to some other bees. They live between 30 and 45 days. A drone bee can live for the summer. And uh, in the fall, 
sad for the drone bees, but the other bees all kick them out. They don't need them through the winter. So the drone bees, they all die in the fall. The queen bee, she can live up to three to four years. And the bees that are inside the hive in the wintertime, they can live for about 200 days. So they live a lot longer than the summer bees. Now, here's a frame. Something kind of funny happened. We put what's called a medium frame into a deep box. So there was some extra room for the bees to make more wax. And they just make it the way that they want to. But there's something really interesting right here. This is called a queen cup. Here, why don't I do that sure. Right so the way that the bees make new queens is they make these little queen cups and the queen will lay an egg in it. <laughs> Don't drop it. Sure. Yep. <laughs> For sure. So this little queen cup here is a special kind of cell and the queen can lay an egg in the bottom. Now she hasn't laid one in this and the bees can draw it down and it'll make what's called a queen cell. And it could be about this long. That's how the queen can grow to be bigger. She has a bigger cell to emerge from. We've got a question from Elizabeth. Yes. I would like to know if bees die when they sting you and why? Okay, <laughs> so they do die when they sting you. Honeybees. Yeah, honeybees, they have what's called, it, it's called a barbed stinger. And so if you looked at the stinger of a wasp or a hornet, it would kind of look like a needle, like a straight arrow that can puncture your skin and then come back out. But when you look at a bee stinger, it looks like that, but it has two little barbs on it. Yeah, little hooks. And so when it punctures your skin, the bee can't pull it back out. And so when the bee pulls off, the stinger stays attached to you. And because of that, the bee will die after a little while. That's partly why bees don't want to sting you unless they really, really have to. So bees will only sting if they're protecting themselves or the other bees. Oh, there's a nice frame of pollen. That'll give you a good look of the different colors of pollen. And the reason pollen can be different colors is because it's coming from all different kinds of flowers. Just more uh, this is this is a new frame we put in, so right. it's it's empty. <laughs> So, um, yeah, this would be a good time to answer any other questions that you might have. You could talk about what to, they can do too. Oh, that's right. While you're thinking about your questions, we'll, we'll share a couple of other things. An important question that I would have for you is, what can most people do to help the honeybees and the natural pollinators? Now, honeybees and the wild bees that live in nature, they're very, very important for us. Um, when they go out to get nectar and pollen from flowers, they're providing a service to that flower too. They're pollinating it. So they're taking little bits of pollen from one flower to the next flower to the next flower. And that's a really important step in fruit growing. And so if you are eating an apple, it's because a bee pollinated a flower on an apple tree. If you're eating a watermelon, it's because hundreds of bees pollinated one flower on a watermelon plant. And all kinds of food that we eat comes from pollinated plants. And so those, those bees and the wild bees and a number of different insects, they're very important for providing us with food. So what are some things that can be done to help the pollinators? Well, they can plant. What you can do is you can look up... Um, the different kinds of wildflowers that bees like, and you can plant those in your gardens at home. Um, there's so many, and every color you can imagine. Um, putting out a little water dish for the bees, because they get thirsty just like we do, um, and just making sure you've got little beads or, or something in the water so that they can sit on the beads to drink, but not drown. Um, Another thing you can do, no matter where you live in Canada, there are probably some local beekeepers. Mm -hmm. And so one thing you could do is try to find out where there are some local beekeepers in your community and encourage your family to buy your honey from them. One thing that that does is it encourages them to take care of the bees and, and make more bee colonies. And so that's an important thing that you can do as well. 
Yeah, and I think it's important to note that honeybees are actually not native to our, our continent, to North America. Uh, they were introduced. We have European honeybees, um, but there are thousands of native bees that we have in North America, um, as many as 800 different species right here in Ontario where we are. Um, and they're of every shape, every color. There's green ones, there's black ones, there's blue ones, there's every color that you can imagine. And they're so beautiful and they do a really, really important thing for nature. And uh, they don't have beekeepers to look after them. So I think it's really important that the things that we do in caring for our yards and, and just for caring for nature, you know, when we go out for a hike or a walk, making sure we don't leave any trace that we were there, um, protecting the different, uh, different, you know, areas of nature for those different native pollinators uh, are really, it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. We've got a question from Jessica. How uh -huh. many different types of bees are there? <laughs> well, there's, I think, I'm going to probably get my stats wrong. There's as many as 2,000, I think, different species of native bees in North America. It might even be higher. For sure, I think the number's around 800 different species for Ontario alone. Um, which is pretty exciting. That includes some of the bees that you'll see in your yard. The bumblebees. You might see the bumblebee or the carpenter bee. They're both really big bees, and they hover around. Uh, there are leaf cutter bees and mason bees. Yeah, mason bees. Sweat bees. Sweat bees are the cool, shiny little green ones. Take some time and Google all the different kinds of of bees in North America. It's pretty crazy how many there are. Mm -hmm. So those bees, they don't produce honey for us like the honeybee does. They've developed different ways to take care of their, their brood, their babies, uh, where they don't need as much nectar. The honeybee, they've been selected and bred over hundreds and even thousands of years to provide lots and lots of honey. They make the honey for themselves. It's, it's an important food to help get them through the winter. But thankfully for us, the bees actually make a lot more honey than they need. And so we're able to take some of it. We've got a question from Samantha. Mm -hmm. um, is it true that bees have more than one stomach? Sort of, yes. <laughs> so if, if you were able to see inside a honeybee, you would see that it has what's called, is it a honey stomach? I think so. My terminology might be wrong, but, but there is what looks like a stomach, like a sack. And, when the bee drinks nectar from a flower, it puts it into that first stomach. Now the stomach that the bee eats from is connected to that and it'll just siphon off a little bit of that nectar as it needs more energy. And then when it gets back to the hive, it actually regurgitates the nectar that was in its stomach and it hands it to another bee. And that bee hands it to another bee. And it might get passed between Oh, who knows, maybe five or 10 different bees before it gets put into a honeycomb. And there are some important things happening when they do transfer that nectar. One thing is they're actually removing some of the water from it as they pass it from bee to bee. Which thickens it up for us. And it makes it <laughs> thicker and it makes it less work for them to have to dry it down. Remember our bees today, they're, they're pulling lots of air into the colony to dry down the honey that's in the comb. If they can get some, some of the water out of it before it even goes in the comb, it's less work for them. And so the other thing that they're doing is they're adding enzymes to that nectar. And that's an important part of the health qualities of honey too. Great question. Mm -hmm. We've got another one from Shannon um, and her grade one class in Ottawa. Do the bees ever just fly away? <laughs> that's a good question too. All right. <laughs> depends on the situation. This is the spring of the year. One of the things that bee colonies want to do in the spring is start new bee colonies. And the way that they naturally do that is through something called swarming. Maybe you've seen swarms of bees before. You might see a cluster of bees hanging off a tree branch or on the side of a car or on a fence. They could be on anything. Now, if you ever see that, you don't have to worry. I wouldn't go poke them or anything, but, <laughs> but you don't have to be afraid. The way that bee colonies reproduce is that they will make some of those queen cups, and we saw a queen cup, and the queen will lay some eggs. And then before those new queens are ready to emerge, the parent queen 
And about half of the bees in the hive will come out of the entrance and they'll fly off together and they'll land in a tree. And while they're sitting in the tree, they're, they're sending scout bees out to look for a new home. And so if those bees find a hollow tree or a soffit in your house or <laughs> chimney. a chimney or strangers. an empty box, they will say that will make a great home. And that queen bee and all those other bees, they'll fly into that new home and they'll start making new comb. And the new one will hatch. Yeah. And then back in the parent hive, a new queen will hatch and those bees will continue as well. So just like other animals reproduce by having babies, uh, they do bee colonies that. reproduce by sending out swarms. And so sometimes the bees do fly off, but they leave enough bees behind to, to keep a healthy hive continuing. Now, there is also something called absconding. And if the conditions aren't right for the bees to stay in their box, if they're getting picked on too much by hornets, or if there's a skunk trying to eat them, or if there's too many pesticides around, they might decide that it's not safe to stay where they are. And in that case, the whole bee colony would fly off and try to find a new home. So part of our job as beekeepers is to try to keep things really safe and healthy and ideal for our bees so that they stay where they are. They also fly away when their life is over. That's true. Another thing is that when a bee knows that its life is almost done and it's going to die soon, it doesn't stay in the hive. It flies off and it will die far away. And that way, if that bee had any kind of sickness or disease, it wouldn't then transfer that to the other bees. So they, they stay very hygienic and they keep each other healthy. So that was a great question. Thanks. Very guys. good. I've got another one if you have time. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay, awesome. Do you have any laws or rules that beekeepers have to follow? Yes. <laughs> there are a lot laws of rules rule. and laws for beekeepers <laughs> to follow. So the first rule, in the province where we live, in Ontario, we are required to register our colonies with the, the Ministry of Agriculture. And they have bee inspectors who travel around and they can, they can come on this property anytime they want. They don't have to tell us. And they can open up our colonies and look through and make sure that they're healthy. And if, if there was a beekeeper nearby whose bees got sick, they would have to notify the bee inspector. And the bee inspector would then notify us and also come and check our hives. They would come and check our hives, and if our bees were sick, they would tell us what to do to help them cook. So can. One thing that we want to do is register our bees. Okay. I'm sorry, it's very much really, really sweaty out here. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So... <laughs> So one thing is uh, we register our bees so that they can be inspected and kept safe. Another thing is that we're not allowed to put the bees too close to anyone's house. So there are rules about how far they must be from a home. Um, there are also rules about safely extracting the honey from the comb and packaging it into bottles. And there are also rules about labeling it so that people know where the honey came from. So yes, there are lots of rules for beekeepers and they're all there to help keep the bees safe and to keep people safe and to keep the honey really, really good. Awesome. A grade six class in Toronto would like to know if the bees ever have to interact with wasps and how do they protect themselves? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's super cool. We've seen it happen. <laughs> so wasps really think that uh, baby bees are yummy. <laughs> Sounds kind of gross, doesn't it? But wasps do like to eat other insects. That's and their protein. That's right. That's their protein source. And so sometimes a wasp will fly up to the entrance of the hive and try to get inside to steal some of those babies and eat them. Uh, but... One of the jobs that the worker bees have is guarding the hive. And so some of those bees that are down there sitting on that entrance, they are looking out for intruders. And if a wasp comes along, they're going to jump on that wasp and grab a hold of it and fight with it to try to get it out. And if the wasp is really persistent, the bees generally can't sting wasps because the exoskeleton of the wasp is really hard 
and they can't get the stinger through. So what the bees do instead is about 50 bees will get onto that wasp and they'll all cling to each other and they'll start flapping their wing muscles to make heat. And they'll get so hot that the wasp will die. The bees will be okay, but the wasp will die. Yeah, bee, and so, bees can handle a little bit warmer than, than a wasp can. That's right. Uh, you know, the other, the other thing that tries to steal from a beehive is other bees. Mm -hmm. So if it's a time of year when the, the flowers have all dried out and there's lots of honey inside the hive, sometimes bees will try to steal honey from each other's <laughs> colonies. Um, and so the guard bees will defend against other honeybees too. All right, our next cat question comes from Andrea. Does consuming local honey help with seasonal allergies? There are many people that claim that consuming local honey is helpful for seasonal allergies. Uh, there's reasons to think that's true. Um, one thing is that local honey has local pollen in it. And so if you're ingesting a small amount of local pollen, it may have a health effect. We're not doctors, so we don't really know, but. Uh, but many people believe so, yes. And through a lot of human history, people have claimed a lot of health benefits from bee products. Mm -hmm. uh, first, the honey, but also the propolis the pollen. and the pollen yeah. and the royal jelly. Royal jelly is a special food we haven't really talked about, but the bees can produce something called royal jelly, and they use that to feed their babies and to feed the queen. And some people believe that that has health benefits, too. And so for thousands of years, you go back to uh, the early days in China and ancient Egypt, and there's evidence that people used bee products as medicine. All right. We have another question from Anton. How can you tell the difference between a drone and a worker bee? Excellent question. So when we had, when I picked up that drone, I don't know if you noticed, but the drones, they're a little bit longer than the worker bees, but they're a lot wider. They're, they're kind of like football players. They're pretty big and tough looking, but kind of like teddy bears too. And they're also <laughs> super lazy. All, yeah. they, all they do is eat. They don't work at all. <laughs> so the drone bees don't actually move too fast either. So you can tell the difference after you've, you've worked with bees for a little while. Some people, when they see a drone bee, they wonder if they're seeing the queen. So it's, it's a little harder to tell the queen from the drones than it is the drones from the workers. But even the queen has her own look too. Yep. Why is there no king bee? Ah, well, we could talk for a long time about <laughs> bee biology, but everyone in the hive has a really important job. Yeah. And the queen's job is to provide life to everyone in the colony. And so she's the mom of all of the worker bees and she's the mom of all the drone bees. Now the drones job, they, they fly off to meet with the new queens from other hives and they take the genetics from this colony and they share it with another one. Now that's pretty complex and kind of hard to understand. But the queen bee isn't called the queen because she's in charge. <laughs> Everybody's in charge together. The bees are always communicating with each other by touching each other <laughs> and by producing pheromones, which are like smells and Thanks by dancing. Yep. So when a bee goes and finds a place where there's lots of nectar, that bee will fly back to the colony and it does what's called a bee dance. It'll shimmy around and turn. And that indicates how far away and in what direction those flowers are. And then other bees will go out and get that nectar. But as those bees are coming back in, the bees that are inside the hive are also telling them we need more nectar or we have lots of nectar, but we need more pollen. And you know, there's a third thing that the bees bring back in, they bring water. And so the ones inside the colony will be telling the ones that fly in and out what to bring back. So the queen's not telling everyone what to do. She's not in charge. They're all working together and every bee has an important job. You should maybe just, just touch on the process, like from egg to... The other job changes, the worker bees? Oh, yes. So the worker bees... Oh, Shauna just had a bee land on her. Went right up my glasses. Uh, the worker bees have a lot of different jobs. So when a bee is first born, it can't even fly yet. Not for about the first week of its life. 
So that bee will be inside the colony working through about the first week that she's alive. And she will be cleaning up different cells. She will be feeding other bees and feeding the baby bees. And she might even have the special job of helping to feed and to clean the queen. As the bees get older, their jobs diversify. So some bees will be guard bees on the entrance and they'll help to protect the hive from any intruders. Other bees will be going out to get nectar or pollen or water, and other bees will be scouts. They'll be out there looking for good places to get more nectar or pollen or water. So they all have very important jobs. Okay, I think we just have one last question. Okay. Do bees drink water, and if so, how? So they do, and they drink it the same way that they consume nectar. So what's it called? Oh, the proboscis. The proboscis. <laughs> Shauna knows all the fancy terms, you see. So they have what's called a proboscis, and it's kind of like a straw. It's like a tongue straw. Yeah, and they're <laughs> able to put that into the flower and suck up nectar, but they can do the same thing with water. And so about 300 feet that way, there's a bird bath, and if we went and looked at it, there would be bees all around the perimeter of the water, all around the edge, and they'd have their little proboscis stuck in the water, and they'd be sucking it up. And they'd be bringing that back to the hive for two reasons. One is to give some a drink to the other bees, but the other is to cool the hive down. So they use water kind of like we do an air conditioner. And they can create like a little mist inside the hive. And as they flap their wings and move that moisture around, it can cool things off. Well, Ken and Shauna, thank you so much uh, for a great tour. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. Yes, we really enjoyed this. <laughs> Have a good one. They want their hive back. They're losing their mind. Yep. <laughs>